Well, hello there, my brothers and sisters. It's Josh Packard. Welcome to another episode of the Golden Image of Churchy Andy is a Lie. Won't you guys rejoice? Christ has done everything for you. You were saved in the fact that he rose from the dead and ascended and this even more, but you were absolutely reconciled to God while you're an enemy to him. You were utterly, utterly without strength. You had no power. You didn't even know what sin was at that point. You weren't even born whenever you were reconciled. When you were born again, it was by Christ. You know, being born again doesn't happen whenever you believe. You were born again when Christ took Adam into death and brought him into resurrection in Christ. That's when we were born again. What's happened is somebody has deceived you and you didn't know it yet. You've been reconciled to God, but somebody says, no, 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 you're not. Not unless you believe. Not unless you accept him in your heart. Not unless you... Um, confess them, not unless you, you know, make a choice for Jesus or whatever thousand different ways you have to hear it in the variations. They still put a stipulation on your salvation, excluding you from the knowledge that you were right before God. So your whole life, not knowing it, you lived as though you were a sinner. Do you guys understand the level of deception that we've been under? And who is responsible for the deception is even the biggest shocker. Because the world is going to turn upside down for those of you who see what we see. The source of Satan and his accusation and what has separated us from the kingdom and the entire world um, is uh, the church. Satan is hiding in the church. He's enthroned in the church. He is Christ to the church. He is Jesus to the church, you guys. So when they're calling, when they're saying Jesus, it's really Satan. It's who they're talking about. You know, I'm sorry. Um, one of the very first books that turned me on to this was the book of Job. And, you know, and I couldn't figure out because his friends were saying right things. And they were condemning Job, and but not, not really realizing it. I mean, you don't understand it until you can see what Elihu says. I think it's in Job 32. But there's these four men and they sound religious and everything they say is pretty much right. They've, they've, they're saying about how God, you know, judges the guilty and, you know, all these things are going through everything. And, and technically what they're saying is correct, but the spirit's wrong. It's, they don't understand what they're doing. They're, they're not, they're correct doctrinally, but because they're on the wrong ground, their doctrine's evil. Because they were condemning Job. See, Job didn't blaspheme God, didn't do anything. Not even through the death of his family, not through his children, not anything. He was still faithful and blessed the Lord. It wasn't until his friends came in. And his friends started condemning him. And, you know, comparing him to images of righteousness and how he falls short and blah, 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 blah. Till eventually uh, he does curse God. He does hold himself more righteous than God. You guys, and so Job isn't as you know blameless and sinless like you guys think. He was through all of that. The tricky part is the ones that came and made him sin were the ones that were his friends. You guys, Satan masquerades as a messenger of light. His servants are messengers of light. It's he's he's beautiful. You guys, he's good. Satan would be good. But his goodness would cause you to be evil because you would compare yourself to the image and you would fall short. Or you would be so self-righteous like the church is today that you can't see beyond that. So I'm here to tell you that everyone's got their own conception of Jesus locked up tight in their minds. Everyone's got this idea of the proper worshiper they want to be. And they're trying to aspire to become the worshiper they want to be. The problem is, is who made that image for them? That image is a contrivance of their own as a result of accusation. So accusation has been the driving factor for everything they've done. Because they don't want to go to hell or because they, they want to measure up or they want to do what's right. They want to be righteous. They want to da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Well, 
in their pursuit of those things, they deny that Jesus has provided those things. Just like Naaman the Syrian, who wouldn't dip in the Jordan until he came to his senses. And then all he had to do was go wash in the Jordan, and he was clean. And so we're always seeking this big, giant thing to do that we think that God would want us to do. But that's, again, the result of accusation. Who is the accuser? And his name is Satan. So you're doing things that seem technically right and good, but that's still according to the knowledge of good and evil, not the tree of life. You're measuring by the fruits of the Spirit on people as to whether or not they've been saved, yet you yourself don't manifest the fruits of the Spirit by your judgment. I mean, on and on and on and on. Death is in the church. The wages of sin is death. But, but a sinner will focus on the word sin and say, oh, because sin is death. Oh, no, no, no. It's the wages of sin, which means your works. It's your efforts that were contrived by sin, that were, that were fueled by sin and accusation and fear and shame and guilt. The works of the flesh that appear righteous. And this is what is going on everywhere. The entire church is built on the works of the flesh. Though they say right things and good things philosophically here and there, because they don't have, they have not received the Christ nor his sacrifice, they cannot be righteous before God and cannot perform the works of righteousness. I'm gonna tell you right now, I go to the ward down my street for the, for the Mormons and their church service is exactly the same as ours. Slight variations, but they get up there in the morning, they sing, they do, their, they do their announcements, they sing from the same Bible hymn book that we have. And the only thing that is really different is the doctrine. But there are always focuses on being good or, or, you know, overcoming sins and blah, 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 blah. Which you go to the church, it's a seamless crossover. Doop. It's all they're talking about. There's no glorification of Christ and his victory. Not at all, not one little bit. You know, they'll say, oh, you've been saved by grace, if you believe. And it's like, once you understand that grace is not just unmerited favor, it is the power of God and the salvation. Grace is, the, is justification embodied. It's the manifestation of God's goodwill and his patience and long-suffering towards us, which causes us to repent. Grace is the power of repentance, which comes through the knowledge of the word, and the word being that you were saved while you're an enemy of God that Christ was a fulfillment of all of God's promises to everything and all of creation, that everything God had promised from the foundation of the world had been manifested in Jesus, resulting in a complete reconciliation of all of creation by the one sacrifice, by the one man, Jesus Christ, forever, for eternity, and, by, and there is nothing else needed, done and done, the glory of God. Yet, you've turned that victory into something that's still to be grasped. So no wonder the world walks around in darkness because the ones that are supposed to have been entering the kingdom of God and ushering them in have not entered in themselves and they prevented them that were. See, I mean, I think we're kind of like a priesthood or we are a priesthood actually, a royal race of priests what God calls us, but we are literally, we're the priesthood and God has raised us up to be priests, yet we ended up becoming doorkeepers. So all those out here, I think those that were of religion were those that were foreordained unto belief, but then they became vain in their imaginations. Because the church is worthless, you guys. You might go there to get a head change or maybe a good feeling of, of something. Um, your spirit, whenever you think you're getting in the spirit, it's not. You're really in a pep rally. It's called psychosemantic manipulation. What they're doing is they just get you all pumped up and then you mistake that for the spirit through their music and through the cadence of the preaching and through all these different things. There's taught in seminary how to make you feel as though you've, it's what they're trying to do is make you feel as though, or actually make you ready to accept suggestion. That's what it's about. It's what hypnotists do. It's what salespeople do. It's the same tactic that's being used in the church to make you think that you're having a religious experience. And it works. It's effective and people fall for it, but they just don't know it because they haven't received the word yet. They haven't seen who the Holy Spirit is and what he does in you that you would see that you had no need for those religious experiences or religious experiences. 
Because the Holy Spirit in us is the spirit of holiness, meaning perfect and entire, lacking in nothing, that Christ has accomplished everything, that there is nothing left, that we are righteous as he is righteous on this earth. This is what the Holy Spirit does in us, makes us righteous to where we can stand the Lord before the Lord without shame and fellowship with him, that we may be transformed according to the renewing of our mind, that we may present ourselves by per removing our hypocrisy. We can present ourselves as living sacrifices for God, being that we're unemployed from any other use but for his. See, the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, were living sacrifices, you guys. They were people that should have been killed, but they weren't. It was the firstborn of Egypt that God took, and so then he killed all them, but he spared Israel, their firstborn. He, he took their priests. Those priests are living sacrifices to our God. So in order for us to be living sacrifices, we have to present ourselves before God, which means we have to be employed, unemployed from our works, you guys. So to be a living sacrifice for God is to lay down your images, lay down your understanding at the feet of Jesus, and then submit wholly to his word. And his word is that you have been reconciled, that God is pleased with you, that you are right before him, that there is nothing left to conquer. There's nothing between you and him before. You've been utterly reconciled and redeemed in the beloved. Done. Now you are a child of God. So you are to live as Jesus in his conscience, that you are reconciled before God, that you're right before him. This is the works, of, this is where righteousness is. This is what it means when you're right before God. So when everybody says, you gotta get right before God, well, there's, the only way you can say that is by accepting Jesus' sacrifice as done and done. <clears throat> like Abel versus Cain. That God's sacrifice was right and enough. Cain was saying, no, uh, this is what you want as a sacrifice. And God's like, oh, I don't want that. Who said I wanted that? Who are you listening to? <clears throat> Cain was dominated by his sin. Abel was dominated by that he acknowledged God's sacrifice was right and enough. And I'm talking about enough. Christ has reconciled everything. We are supposed to be heralding this to the sinners, to the lost, and telling them that you have been reconciled. You have no more need to hide like this. You're done and done in the hopes that they would turn from their sin. And they're, see, I think that's a big deal in the church too. They, they think repenting from their sin is not doing the bad things. Well, your sin is actually empowering you to do your good things, the works of the flesh and self-righteousness to where you look righteous and holy and just and pure to those with an untrained mind, an untrained heart more importantly. But you guys gotta see those with a trained heart and a trained eye and a trained mind can see your works for what they are. And they're bogus, they're hypocrisy, they're pretend. Because you think God wants this. So you're still working towards that. To where those of us who can see know that God wants this. He just wants you. Done. Nothing else. So then now, me knowing that I've been reconciled to my God and my Savior, that I live as though I've been saved. I live as though I'm not afraid of my sins and death and live as far as, you know, what troubles may come. I'm walking with him daily. I only set my mind on him. I'm looking for him in everything I see. I think that's a big deal because in the scriptures, I've, I've been talking with, you know, I've been talking with Christians for a long time, you know. But they're always just going to line upon line. It's like they're they don't see Christ in the scriptures. They they're they're still looking to make a formula. So like everything's out of context. Like whenever you, they start comparing scriptures with scriptures, you're going, those don't even apply together. They're not even that has nothing to do with each other. And and it's just like the weirdest thing. Where it, my secret, and I'm going to tell you, is that uh, I was lucky enough that people pointed me in the right place. Um, right off the bat, but I look for Jesus in everything. I look for him. I look for him in the priesthood. I look for him in the blood sacrifices. I look for him in the 12 tribes of Israel. I look for him in the creation. I look for him in Joseph. I look for him in Isaac, Jacob, 
Abraham. I look for him and everywhere I see, I'm just looking for Christ. That's all I'm doing is looking for Jesus. And I keep finding him everywhere. But the thing is, is where I've been finding him, it leads me in the right place. <clears throat> so if you see the tabernacle and how it lays, lays out, um, it's amazing. You can see clearly how Christ has entered in as the high priest and has saved us and reconciled us. And that as he lives, ever lives in our seed, we're in there with him the entire time. But Christ took us in as a result of him going into his office. We were without strength. We had without knowledge. We didn't even know we were lost. We had no idea when he took us in. So now the word is that Christ has entered his priesthood. We are saved. Adam sinned. We were, we were going to burn. <laughs> Christ, well, I shouldn't say even burn because burn is where you want to go. We're going to go to the place of the dead. Uh, but because of Christ, we've been reconciled, redeemed. And Christians were like, oh, no, but if you believe, except for the fact that Christians don't even believe because they're still going about to establish their own righteousness by their own mouth that condemn themselves. You guys, all these harvest crusades, all these things that are all for Satan, with nice people, with great senses of humor, and they just they just really sound really funny and nice, and and they're, everything they say is technically kind of true, but you can't put your finger on what's wrong. Well, I'm going to tell you, Jesus has done everything. You're now the the matter is of obeying God's ordinances and commands and the statutes when in doubt. It's, so everything I want to do is I want to live for God. I want to obey his commandments and the statutes to the best of my ability because I've seen that they're good for me. They're good for my family. They're good for everyone I love. They're good for my community, my country. It makes me a positive blessing to the people around me. So I have the choice. There's several of my friends that have heard the truth I shouldn't say several, but there's a few of my friends that have heard the truth. But because they don't employ themselves to God's glory and went back to just employ their lusts and to go in and, and, and waste all their time and energy and money to get drunk and high and just, you know, being free, free, they think, um, they've, they've gone mad. God gives them up to their, their desires and their lusts and they just go off and become, I mean, really bad people. But the ones that abide, the ones that abide with Christ, they grow. They get free from those things, which is liberty. See, what happens is a lot of Christians become caught up in their freedom to be able to do whatever they want. And they can. They're reconciled to God eternally. But they are going to be punished for those things in their life. And more extraordinarily so, because they've, they've taken the mouth of Christ. Or they've said that they are Christians. So God will put the hammer on them. It's just the way it is. If, if, if I go around professing that I'm a Christian and, that I, and, and I do the things that dishonor God, he'll hammer me. So I know the things that I, I know my, uh, my barriers. I know where I can go with the Lord. It's great. And it's not that he would cast me off, but because he's a good father, he's got to punish me, to correct me, and to bring me to where he knows is the best good for me. And that's what he does. So, I mean, saying shit, ass, balls, fuck, that kind of stuff does not bother God. Not little, one little bit. Not one little bit. Okay? When God will hammer me is whenever I try to pretend like I'm better. Or that because God gives me some sort of special blessing because I'm good. Or because I've done something that you haven't done. Or blah, 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 blah. Pretty much anything the church does. If I do it, God hammers me. Because the, the thing is, is that, that my, my sins, because to some people they're not sins, to some people they are sins, it's, it's whatever, it's not based upon our sins. But what happens is if I become a gatekeeper and I exclude people from the kingdom, well, I exclude myself. So let's say here that I've heard the Lord, like I did, because I heard him and then I, I went and did the exact Christian thing and I became a gatekeeper telling people they had to believe, they had to confess that Jesus was the Lord, blah, 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 blah. Did all this, say the sinner's prayer and blah, 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 and the Great Commission and everything. And until you realize um, that's exactly opposite of what God did. He utterly, freely saved the world. I was behaving as a gatekeeper, not realizing it, thinking I was helping. 
But what I was doing was I was just putting a barrier before them and I was bringing myself out of the kingdom as well. Because whatever thing I burdened, I lifted on them for their salvation, I had to accomplish. And I'm like, oh, I can't do that. Because I'm going to tell you, I struggled with belief at the beginning. And, and, you know, I believe that there was a God and I believe there was a Jesus. But to believe, I mean, I didn't believe that he saved me 100%. I didn't believe that he reconciled me to God 100%, that I could stand and appear before God just as he was. I was just like everybody else, trying to become righteous and trying to act good and trying to, to polish myself up. But that just kept killing me, wearing me out. So rather, I learned that I was, once I understood that I was putting a magnifying glass on myself, and as long as I put the magnifying glass on myself, I would ferret out all my failures and shortcomings and see how there is no way that I could be saved. But as soon as I turned that magnifying glass on Jesus and looked at his glory and his honor and his magnificence and his perfection and his greatness and his love for me, and his love for you and the world and how much, in it. and then all of a sudden, those things didn't mean anything anymore. So, you know, and I'll always put this back to Trent because he sent me a great meme that said, you know, from Martin Luther that said, if, you know, he says, when I look at myself, I could never see how I could be saved. But when I look at Jesus, I can't see how I could ever be lost. So today, you need to take your magnifying glasses off of yourself and of other people and looking around and, and even off of doctrines and everything else and just turn it and just simply turn it and put it on Jesus and look for him. Look at him. When you're reading the scriptures, look for him. Look for him. I see him everywhere. Look at Ezra. Look at Nehemiah. Look at, I mean, look at these things. Look at that third temple. I mean, it's clearly a complete representation of Christ. I mean, you just keep going down through the ages. Look at Isaiah 53. Look at, you know, all these, look at you know, Ezekiel 37. Look at, you know, you're just boom, 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 boom. You're just being all the time. There's Christ everywhere. Look at the whole development of the, the, the 12 tribes of Israel. Look at, look at the Levites. They're Jesus. They're a complete picture of the priesthood of Christ. Look at King David. Look at Solomon. Look at... Look at all these people. Look at Joseph. Look at look at everywhere you look. Look at Jonah. Look at look at everywhere and just look. What did Christ do? How is this a picture of Christ? How how does this apply to what he's accomplished on the cross? And pretty soon you start seeing it was it was always, you know, the Israelites couldn't touch anything that the Levites did. They did, they become killed. So atonement was always made apart from them. The only time they ever did was the Day of Atonement. That's the only time, and it cost them that precious little sheep that they had. It was a day of mourning. It wasn't a day of joy. You guys gotta understand, this is, Jesus has done everything for us. Look at the high priest. Look what he did on his way in. Look at the altar of incense when he took everything in with him. Then you just gotta find out what the altar of incense is. Then you gotta understand that there's fire in the incense. There's coals, burning coals, causing that incense to rise. And you're like, what? And you're like, where's that fire? I thought fire was hell and blah, 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 blah. But fire is God's righteousness. And we are the incense and the smoke of our, the smoke of it rises before God so his glory can shine in it. You guys gotta see that the, the incense was perpetual, the oil was perpetual, the showbread was perpetual, the, the you know, the fire and the you know, altar burnt sacrifice, always perpetual, perfect, perpetual. Then you find out who lit that fire in the altar burnt sacrifice. Who lit that fire? That was fire from heaven. God lit it himself. And that's where you know uh, Aaron's sons, they tried to offer strange fire. They got it from somewhere else besides that altar that God lit on himself. You, you just keep going down through everything. God was in the fire on the mountain, on Mount Sinai. When Moses came down, he wrote on the fig, the whole top of Mount Sinai was on fire. But no, no, fire's hell. Jesus baptized it with the Spirit and with fire. But no, 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 fire's hell. We see Moses sees the bush that is burning, but not, as con but not consumed. Oh, but fire is hell. You know, you just keep going through. Um, it's like, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, when they get thrown in the fire, who was in the fire with them? There was Jesus in the fire, but no, 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 fire is hell. I mean, it's just like, man, everything that, it's just, 
modern, the churches don't realize because they don't understand that they're righteous. They don't get it yet. They don't even understand what righteousness is yet, nor do they understand what sin means. They don't understand anything, what reconciliation, atonement, propitiation. They have these vague understandings, but they use them. Holiness is a big one. They have no idea what holiness means. To be holy just means to be satisfied in everything. That your needs for righteousness are met. Your needs for reconciliation are met. Your needs for everything are met in Christ. So when Christ alone is holy or God alone is holy, it means that he's the only one in need of nothing. And that's where we need to be, is to be in that holiness to where everything's been satisfied because we've received it from Christ. We're not trying to gain it. We're not trying to advocate for it. We're not trying to grab it. We're not trying to do anything. It's already packed away and kept in eternal treasures. We cannot lose them. Because it's by Christ, and as long as he's a priest, we're with him. So he will never give up his priesthood. As long as he's a king, we'll be with him because he's the perfect king. So he's never going to give up his kingship. So then, so then no matter what, whatever he is, wherever he is, we will be with him. For as long as he's there, we're going to be with him. And this is being saints, sinners, whatever you have to say. There's been some sick people in the world. And I'm not saying God doesn't punish them. Not only was their life punishment, but I'm pretty sure the, the lake of fire will have some more punishment. But for correction, you guys. I mean, there's a lot going on here that we're not taking into consideration. I mean, you got to start looking at where Paul says, deliver people up to Satan, that their flesh may be destroyed, that their, their soul may be saved. <clears throat> Satan's even being used in this, you guys. And he doesn't, I don't think he realizes it. I don't think he knows what he's doing. I, I think he's really trying to destroy, but then through, but what he's using to destroy us doesn't, you don't realize, he doesn't realize that it makes us stronger. So <clears throat> there's so much that I want to share with you guys. And there's so much that I would love to show, but it's just so hard to do on a video. Um, you know, I'd really like to get together with some people in Bible study. Um, we can go through, <clears throat> I want to take like a, a chalkboard and, and like go through all this stuff with you and show you how it operates. Um, but anyway, I don't know how to, there's a lot of weirdos out there, so I got to figure out a way. If you know me personally, definitely call me. Um, and on, you know, anyway, we can, uh, we can figure out a way to meet, message me, do whatever you want to do on the, on the, on this YouTube app or, uh, you know, I'll set up an email or something eventually, but um, there's a lot going on here that you guys need to see that's, that I can't show you because it's of the limited time and the limited scope of this video. So, anyway, all right, well, have a wonderful day. <clears throat> you're reconciled. Live as though you're reconciled. Live as though you have a Savior, all right? All right, have a good day.